Welcome to our first lesson in Texas government. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of a disclaimer before we start that I usually start this class with more um, foundational concepts like a little bit of history and we kind of build on that um, during the semester. However, this year we're starting the course just as early voting is starting in Texas. And so I'm going to jump in in the middle, and then after unit one, we're going to go backwards and catch some of the introductory materials. So we're going to start with voting and elections. Texas has a Republican form of government, and that is Republican with a little r, um, not a Republican with a big r, which is the party. Now this means that our government is a representative democracy based on popular sovereignty. The representative democracy part means that we as voters elect people to go to Austin and make the laws on our behalf. We don't actually go and vote on whether or not something should be a law. So that's the representative democracy part. The popular sovereignty part means that it is us, the people, the voters, who decide who is going to be the leader in the government. Now the ultimate governing authority is with the people who elect the officials, but really what that means um, is that it is the people who vote who elect the officials. Everybody who's eligible to vote is eligible to have a say in who is the official um, that is elected and who is going to um, be instrumental in making the laws. As voters, we are hiring somebody to go to Austin and put forth legislation um, and vote the way that we have hired them to do. Texas is a Jacksonian democracy and this is Jacksonian as in Andrew Jackson, who thought that the more elected officials, the better the democracy. The fewer the elected officials, the weaker the democracy. So the goal is to have a lot of elected officials um, under a Jacksonian democracy if you're going to have a stronger um, democratic system. In Texas, we have got this beat. If you've ever voted and looked at your ballot, it is a long ballot, especially compared to other states. So we are really winning at this Jacksonian democracy thing. Now, the system of democracy is pre premised on voting, meaning if you don't vote, you're not really actually um, a decision maker and you're not the one who um, is choosing the leaders. So if you are, um, if you're eligible to vote and you don't vote, then you don't really have um, a say in who is elected. So who can vote in Texas? You have to be a citizen. You have to be 18 years of, of age and a resident of the state based on intent. Now, what this means is that um, if you have a house in Texas and a house in Florida and maybe you spend, you know, a week in Texas every year and the rest of the time in Florida, if you consider yourself a Texan and you intend to be a resident of Texas, then you can still vote in Texas. Now you can't vote in Texas and in Florida because that would not be fair, but you can register to vote in Texas. Um, because your, your intent is to be a resident of that state. There's not any kind of a, a rule or a regulation that says that your feet must be on Texas soil for X number of hours or days or months during the year in order to be considered a resident for purposes of voting. Um, you also have to not be found to be mentally incompetent. Um, you can be mentally incompetent and still be eligible to vote, but if you have been adjudicated mentally incompetent, so if you've gone before a judge and a judge has ruled that you are mentally incompetent, then you are not eligible to vote. But as long as you haven't gone to court and no judge has actually found that, then you can continue to vote. 
you cannot be serving a sentence, parole, or probation for a felony. And this is really tricky because um, sometimes it's confusing about when you have finished serving your sentence. You can be discharged from prison, but then you're still considered serving your sentence if you are required to serve um, time as parole or probation or something like that. The best thing if you have a question about this for your own personal um, case is to check with your parole or probation officer or ask the judge who sentenced you whether or not you are um, still eligible to vote. You have to be registered for um, at least 30 days before the election. Um, you cannot do this online. You have to either go to the registrar's office or um, actually fill out a form by mail and put a stamp on it and put it in the mailbox. Um, or you can register when you're renewing your driver's license. Now you cannot have been purged from the voters rolls and the way you get purged from the voters rolls is if you show up on a coroner's report, which means you died, um, or if you moved without changing your address. So um, there on your voter registration card, there is um, a statement that says return service requested. And what that means is it's telling the um, post office that if they try to deliver this voter registration card to someone at that um, address and it's an invalid address or the person's moved, then they have to return the voter registration card to the voter registrar and so you can be purged from the rolls. Now you can re-register when you um, if you find out you got purged from the rolls because you didn't change your address, but you just might be surprised if you've recently moved and you go to try to vote. Now in Texas, you can vote by mail if you are 65 years or older, disabled or out of town. Um, a lot of other states allow voting by mail a lot more liberally. Texas does not. We're still pretty strict about it. You can also vote early in Texas, and um, you can vote for um, 14 days before the election. So there's a 14-day period of early voting, and it has to end four days before the election. So um, early voting in Texas, I believe, started on the 13th of October, and it will go until October 30th. And then um, that is for the general election, which is November 3rd. Now ballots are printed in a native language of 5% or 10,000 people in a county if there is a group of, of people that speak a language um, and they do not speak English well. And so it'll still be printed in English, but um, ballot can, a ballot can be printed in another language. Um, this varies county by county. Some of the counties um, have you know certain languages, some have others. Um, it's, it's not the same county by county. Everybody's got English, I think everyone has Spanish, but um, for example, and maybe in some of the West Texas counties, they don't need the same um, languages as maybe in Houston or Dallas or some of the larger cities. Now something you should realize is that it is really difficult to vote in Texas, um, much more difficult than it is in other states. Um, we have the registration requirement that you have to register at least 30 days before an election. In North Dakota, you don't have to register to vote at all. You just show up the day of and vote, and that's it. Um, in California and Oregon, you are automatically registered to vote. Um, and then some other states have day of registration where you can show up to vote and um, register all at the same time. In 2011, um, Texas passed the voter ID law, which said that you had to show one of seven forms of identification in order to vote. The seven forms are a driver's license, a um, military um, ID, a state-issued ID card or government-issued ID card, 
of course, since it's Texas, your concealed handgun license, your passport, your citizenship certificate, if it has a picture on it. And um, you could also get an election identification, which was free. It's just something you had to get, obviously, before you went to the polls. Um, at the time this law was passed, there were 600,000 people who were otherwise eligible to vote, but they lacked the proper um, identification, so they would be turned away at the polls. Why did we need this law? Um, well, it was enacted to prevent voter fraud and protect the integrity of the election, both things that are um, admirable, things that you, you want to have in a democracy. However, when the courts were examining this law to see if it violated the right to vote that is guaranteed to citizens of the United States, they weighed the number of documented cases of voter fraud, which was um, very close to zero, if not zero, versus the effect of suppressing the vote um, of groups that um, usually align with the Democratic Party. So we'll talk about um, that a little bit later, what, um, what voters typically align with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party just based on broad data. But um, it showed that, you know, an examination showed that the 600,000 people who were otherwise eligible to vote um, but for their um, proper identification were um, a majority of those people would have voted um, Democrat in an election. So um, the court ruled that this was um, voter suppression and um, the law that as it was adjusted allows um, for, you know, if you don't have one of these seven forms of acceptable ID, you can sign an affidavit with a reason why you don't have one of those pieces of identification and you can provide another form of identification, something reliable like a birth certificate, a water bill, a paycheck. Think about if you have children and you have to show proof of residency every year, um, something like a lease agreement or you know, your gas bill or something like that, something that shows that you are in the right place to vote. Um, you actually live at you know, the address that is, um, that is in the records for you and that you are able to vote. Voter turnout um, peaked in 1960 at 63.1%, and that is when um, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, was running against Richard Nixon. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but when there is a contested race, something like Kennedy versus Nixon that everybody was on the edge of their seats for, the voter turnout is higher. I'm going to be very interested to see um, what voter turnout looks like for this 2020 election, just because it seems like early voting numbers are incredibly higher than they usually are. And so um, it'll be interesting to see if that's um, just more people are trying to vote early to avoid long lines on election day, or if um, voter turnout really is going to be um, significantly higher than in previous years. In 2016, um, voter turnout was 54.7%. So if you think of that, 54.7% is percent of um, people who are eligible to vote who actually voted. So 54.7% um, just means half of the people are making the choice on who is going to be, for example, president or who is going to um, serve in Congress, things like that. Turnout has declined um, since 1960, but the number of people voting has increased since there's a larger voting age population. Um, in 1972, um, there was a, the 26th Amendment was passed um, to the United States Constitution, and that lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. The theory here, um, in 1972, there were 18 year olds being drafted by, you know, um, by the government that they did not elect um, because they weren't eligible to vote to go fight in a war. And so 
um, the thought was if you are old enough to go um, fight because you're being drafted, you should be old enough to vote. But what we know is that the um, voting rate, the turnout rate of 18 year olds, 19 year olds and 20 year olds is historically very low. So basically all we did was add another um, big group of people who were not going to vote anyway. And so that dragged the voter turnout down um, a little bit more. And then finally, um, voter turnout has declined because um, more people now identify as an independent. Um, and if there is a lack of party identification or affiliation um, or even just a weak um, identification with a certain party, um, that person who considers themselves a quote independent um, is less likely to vote than somebody who is very strongly in favor of one party or the other. Compared to other countries, um, voters, people in the United States don't turn out to vote. Um, as you can see, all of these other countries have a higher voter turnout um, than the United States does. Um, the United States, there's probably just um, three or four other countries that have a lower voter turnout than the US. Um, all of these other countries, though, have much easier voter registration um, laws. And so it's easier to vote, and um, so people actually do vote. There's a lot of um, a lot of scholarship and a lot of studies on um, who votes and who doesn't vote and why do they vote and there's a lot of data that's collected um, to try to determine you know what the trend is and and what is um, a characteristic of somebody who is more or less likely to vote. There are political scientists who work on this nonstop. Um, and what they have found, just very, very generally, painting with a very broad brush, is that um, education, income, age, interest in politics, and identification with a party are all things that affect voter turnout. Um, the higher education level you have, the more likely you are to vote. The higher income you have, more likely to vote. Older people are more likely to turn out to vote. And then the last two are really um, pretty common sense that if you are more interested in politics, you um, actually pay attention to um, who's running and what propositions are listed on the ballot, things like that. If you're interested in politics, if you're interested in voting, you are going to get out and vote, which makes sense. Um, also, if you are um, intensely identified with a um, one party or the other, a Democrat or a Republican, then you are more likely to um, make the time to go out and vote. Now there's something called a participation paradox. And um, what that means is that people will continue to vote even though everybody knows that a single vote doesn't really shift the election. The president doesn't get elected by one voter in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, the governor doesn't get elected by one voter in Texas. So, but even though we know that, still people will go out and vote. Um, who doesn't vote? People whose um, party is very likely to win just because they think like, I don't really need to get out there and vote because it's, you know, it's, it's a given that um, that my party is going to win, and so my vote's not really going to going to put anybody over the top. But also, people who are on the margin of society, um, which just means not very involved in society, are less likely to vote. So, people who are homeless or mentally ill, people who have been discriminated against historically, or um, have a criminal history, or part of some sort of a fringe group 
then those people are less likely to feel part of society and feel like they, um, they need to vote and have their voice heard. When compared to the rest of the United States, Texas is at the bottom of um, voter turnout. So we usually are between 47, number 47 and number 50 um, in the percentage of voter turnout. Um, you can see the orange line on this slide represents the voter turnout in the United States in um, presidential, which is the peaks, and midterm, which is the valleys elections and um, Texas consistently just has lower voter turnout than the rest of the United States. So why is that? Is it because Texans just don't care about voting? Texas don't care about politics? Not really. Um, it's more of a historical um, thing than just a current state of um, or attitude um, about politics. So Texas's turnout is lower than urbanized and industrialized states. So the people in the, um, you know, the the Northeast or the Midwest, the Upper Midwest, um, our turnout is more comparable to states in the Deep South. So places like Alabama and Georgia and um, Mississippi. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, could be legal constraints, could be socioeconomic characteristics of, of our um, voters. It could be the political structure, party competition, or the political culture. And we're going to talk about each of those um, a little bit more specifically. But there's lots of reasons why um, Texans are generally um, least, the least likely to vote. First of all, there are legal constraints, um, and there's a history of different groups being um, denied the right to vote. So um, you'll see in this, um, this chart, every time it says voided, that's where the Supreme Court has examined the law and um, in, in the context of a um, court case and has found Texas's law to be unconstitutional. So um, when looking at all of the, the different laws, ask yourself, does Texas make it convenient and set minimum standards to encourage voting? Or does Texas put barriers on the way to the polls, making it physically, financially, and psychologically difficult to vote? So thinking about that, let's look at what history says. So um, Texas came up with a poll tax in 1902. Um, this meant that if you were gonna go vote, anybody could go vote, but you had to pay um, a poll tax. And so if you couldn't afford the poll tax, then you couldn't vote. So who did this keep away? It kept away the lower income um, people who would would vote for um, you know the the party that was not favored by the higher income um, groups and since they were controlling the government at the time um, they were controlling the the house and the senate um, they were making the rules this was um, challenged in court and um, found to be unconstitutional. Um, women were not given the right to vote until 1918. And um, so for you know many years, women, even though they may have been able to pay the poll tax or may have been able to um, qualify to vote, um, they were not allowed to vote. It was only, um, only men who could vote. And so um, once women started voting, then um, you know, that they became more involved in the political process. In 1906, um, there was a rule in Texas that um, only white people could vote in the primary elections. And um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next um, lecture. But um, during that time, um, 
the primary election was really the only election in Texas. There wasn't a, um, it, basically, if you won the primary, then you were going to win the general election because there wasn't really any kind of a um, competition between um, the, it was the Democrats, actually, the Democrats and then the Republicans. So if you won um, the Democratic primary, you were going to be the, the nominee from the state or that you were going to be the um, the sure winner of whatever you were running for. Um, so because white people like to only keep voting for white people um, in, you know, back in 1906, um, the government, the Texas government said um, only white people could vote in the primary. And um, that law was challenged and overturned um, by the Supreme Court in 1944. Um, there was a history of people who were away serving in the military not being able to vote. And this was um, held unconstitutional in 1965. There was a um, residency requirement for many, many years in Texas um, that you had to live in Texas for a certain amount of time um, in order to be eligible to vote there. This was thrown out in 1972, and that's where we get our resident by intent. Um, there was a requirement for property ownership for many, many years. And again, this is just the rich, um, usually white people, trying to keep people who had a lower income not able to own property from voting and kind of messing up um, their election and their government. Um, this was thrown out by the Supreme Court in 1969. There was a requirement in Texas that you had to register, re-register every single year. And um, the Supreme Court found no reason for that and found that it only served to um, make voting more difficult and thus essentially denying um, a person the right to vote. And that was um, thrown out in 1971, as was early registration. Now, we do have to register early in Texas. 30 days, more than 30 days before the election. But um, it used to be months and months. And so six months or nine months or a year or something like that, it, it varied over time. And um, the Supreme Court found that that, that requirement was um, too much of a hindrance on um, the right to vote and encumber the right to vote too much and was essentially um, denying a person's right to vote. Um, finally, it used to be that if you were registered to vote, that is where um, the courts would would find people who would be um, required to serve on a jury or have to go to jury duty. Um, so people would avoid registering to vote because they didn't want to go to jury duty. Um, this practice has changed, so you can rest assured if you register to vote, you are not going to be more likely or less likely to be called for jury duty than if you don't register to vote. Um, the jury um, pools are taken from the um, driver's license registry, and so um, if you have a driver's license, you can be, um, you can be called to um, show up for jury duty. So another reason why Texans don't vote is based on demographics. So we talked about how um, people with a higher income and um, a higher level of education um, are more likely to vote. Well, in Texas, about 15% of our um, eligible voters live in poverty. And so um, they are, you know, lower income, thus less likely to vote. Also, um, there are about 25% of Texans who are 25 years or older who are not high school graduates. So again, lower education equals um, less likely to vote. Now, the political structure um, may deter some Texans from voting. Texas has a very long ballot, like we've talked about, the Jacksonian democracy, and there are multiple elections throughout the year. 
um, city elections, county, school boards, special districts, bonds, all kinds of things that we are asked to educate ourselves and vote on. And um, sometimes people just get fatigued by having to go vote one more time. Um, the more offices that you have to vote for, um, the more Jacksonian the democracy, but also the lower the turnout. And then party competition may be a reason why some Texans don't vote. When there is one party um, that is most likely going to win, um, voter turnout is lower than if there's a contested election. If um, you know that a Republican is always going to win in Texas, then you're probably not going to vote if, if, if you are a Republican because your vote won't um, matter. There's obviously enough other people voting um, for the Republican Party. And if you're a Democrat, you're thinking there's not enough of us to make any kind of a dent in um, this Republican voting block. And so um, why do I need to get out there, waste my time and waste my um, effort to vote? And then finally, um, the political culture in Texas may be one of the reasons why um, Texans just traditionally don't vote. Um, political culture we'll talk about in the next unit, but it is a set of political values and beliefs that are dominant in a society. And so in Texas, like I said, we are more um, aligned with the Deep South, which is a traditionalistic um, point of view. Um, these are people who were plantation owners, um, lots of slaves, and the turnout is lower among the groups that um, are the non-historically, you know, um, plantation owners. Basically, throughout the Deep South, um, it was, you know, the women didn't need to vote because their husbands were voting. And um, the slaves weren't allowed to vote or were discouraged from voting. Um, and so really, the only people who ever voted were the rich white guys. And so um, just kind of the psychology um, carries over for generations and generations. Um, and it's probably just now with maybe my generation that um, that, that is starting to change and that um, people in my generation and, and after are thinking, well, no, we don't, I mean, we're not going to leave all the decisions up to um, rich white guys. I think that our voice is just as important too. The um, moralistic political culture is the um, predominant culture in um, the New England states of the Northeast, and their turnout is usually significantly higher than um, those of us in the South. And then there is um, the individualistic culture, which is um, in the mid-Atlantic states. And um, we're not really sure. We're still studying that voter turnout to see what um, you know, what effect that political culture has um, on voter turnout. Texas is a mix of this traditionalistic and individualistic um, cultures, and so we have um, a pretty low voter turnout. In Texas, we don't buy into the part participation paradox, so we don't believe, um, even though my one vote doesn't matter, um, I should still get out there and vote. We just say, well, there's a lot of other people in Texas and um, they're all voting and so we're just gonna leave the election up to them. People were asked um, in 2016 what their top five reasons were for not voting. And um, first, as I'm sure you're not surprised, is that they didn't like the candidates or the issues. Um, 2016 was the year of people saying, I hate both of the political, I mean, the presidential candidates, but, you know, I, so I'm not going to vote or I'm going to vote for um, a third party or um, I'm going to just try to figure out the, the least terrible candidate to vote for. Um, the second reason was they just weren't interested in voting or they were too busy, had a schedule conflict. Um, sometimes it's hard to, you know, not every employer gives time off of work to vote. Um, and so that trend is changing, but sometimes it's just hard to get out to the polls. 
Um, some people were either ill or disabled and therefore not voting, or they were out of town and didn't um, plan ahead enough to get an absentee ballot. So how can you participate in the government um, if you maybe aren't eligible to vote or you don't want to vote um, and you also don't want to run for office? There are lots and lots of ways. So um, I think there are 12 different ways on this list right here. You can write letters. You can sign a petition, which now you can do online. You can talk to your friends or your coworkers about political issues. You can call your Congress people. Anybody can call Congress people. When my daughter was um, in junior high, she was really fired up about um, a cabinet pick that was um, being discussed. And she used to get out of class um, and her teachers would let her go stand out in the hall and call her congressperson to tell, um, you know, to tell them what they thought about, um, what she thought about um, how the confirmation hearings were going. So anybody can call a congressperson. Um, you can distribute campaign literature. So go door to door and, and drop off those um, flyers on people's doors. You can contribute money to a campaign. Believe me, the campaigns will always take your money. They don't care if you're registered to vote or not. Um, you could put a bumper sticker on your car. You could post some political support on your social media accounts. You could join an interest group like a trade association. If you're an electrician and you're in the um, IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, then um, you are a member of an interest group who will use some of their money and some of their influence to try to um, make sure that people elected are keeping um, the union's interests um, in mind when they're voting. You can serve on a political party committee. Um, there are all kinds of committees that um, will phone bank or they'll, um, you know, uh, pass out literature, do all kinds of things, and you can serve on one of those committees. You could act as a delegate to a convention. Um, before I was 18, I was a youth delegate to a national convention, which meant that I um, went and basically worked for free, but um, was able to make signs that they held on the convention floor and um, was able to meet all different kinds of um, politicians and celebrities who were um, also attending that convention. And then finally, you can participate in a demonstration, a march, or a sit-in to um, try to affect change, try to influence um, the government. If you have participated in any kind of demonstration um, recently, um, you have probably seen that um, there are all kinds of people there. There are people there that are not legal citizens. There are people there that are not old enough to vote. There are children um, who attend those demonstrations and um, you don't have to be registered to vote in order to, um, to attend some sort of a, a demonstration or a march. Now, this is where we get to our first quiz. Um, what I would like you to do, the first quiz is not going to be multiple choice, but what I would like you to do is email me your number from this. So of the 12 things um, that you can do besides voting and running for office, um, all you have to do is just email me your number. It can be zero, it can be 12, um, could be anything in between. You're not gonna be graded on your number. I'm just curious um, your level of participation. Um, I will tell you that my number is 12. I have done every single one of those things. Um, I vote. I've not run for office, but um, I've done every other one of those things. And um, so it doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm better or worse than somebody else. Um, it's just something that, um, that I'm curious where you fit in. So quiz number one, just send it to me by the end of um, the unit, so November 1st.
Okay, so we're on slide number 16 of 33. So that gives you an idea of how, um, how far we have progressed and how much more we have left. And so we're gonna talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of an election right now. So how does somebody actually make it onto the ballot? And, um, you know, how does somebody make it onto a primary ballot? And where do these people come from, basically? Um, and so there's two different processes. Step one is like the primary convention petition process, and then step two is the general election. So step one is um, the kind of the preliminary stage of getting you um, ready to um, be in the general election. So there used to be um, a caucus, which was um, a meeting of party members to select a candidate. Um, so what that meant was that if you were, if your party chose to caucus in a primary, um, which the Democrats did until 2016, I believe, was the first year that they didn't. It might have been 2008. I mean, 2012. Um, sorry, um, but um, the Democrats would caucus, and what that would mean is they would. Um, after the polls closed, they would all get together and um, not all, but some would get together and try to um, convince everyone to um, pledge the votes from their precinct um, for one candidate or another. So they would say, you know, hey, this precinct is going to um, be pledged for Obama or this one was going to be pledged for Clinton or something like that. Um, we don't do that anymore in Texas. Um, there are party conventions, which just means that members of a party um, select delegates and those people select a candidate. It's kind of a two-step process instead of your vote in the primary actually going to a candidate, it goes to a delegate and then the delegates are the ones who vote and select a candidate. And then in Texas, what we have is a direct primary um, the Republicans have been using this for a long time, um, and Democrats now use the same um, system. And what that is, is that if you vote in the primary election, you are selecting the candidate. So it's just a direct, um, a direct vote. Texas uses this primary system, um, and those primaries are run by private organizations. And they're only regulated to the extent that the organization's activity violates the law. So like when Texas tried to have a white primary, they could for a while because um, it was a private group holding the primary. Um, but then the court stepped in and said, yeah, you, you have to follow some basic laws. You can't um, absolutely um, trample on people's civil rights during the primary process. Um, the primary is required for any party that received 20% of the gubernatorial vote in the prior election. So if you did that in Texas, you have to hold a primary. Um, when I say the primaries are run by the private organizations, they're run by the parties. And so it's the parties that will rent the voting machines or will have people um, at you know, staffed at the primary to um, help you, you know, cast your vote, things like that. So if you go vote in a primary, you'll see sometimes that, you know, well, one side may have 12 voting machines while the other one only has two. Well, that's just kind of the way that, um, that those two just individual um, organizations chose to um, chose to run their primary. Um, other parties, if you don't have 20% um, of the gubernatorial um, vote in the prior election, um, use the convention system. So let's do an example. If the Green Party receives 24% of the vote in the 2016 gubernatorial election, in 2020, the Green Party must participate in the direct primary system. However, if the Tea Party received only 14% of the vote in the 2016 gubernatorial election, in 2020, it uses the convention system. 
So the convention system is what I talked about earlier, where the um, instead of voting for the candidate, you vote for a delegate, and the delegates choose um, the candidate. If you're a new party, you must file a list of supporters that is equal to 1% of the total vote for governor in the last election. So total Democrat, Republican, any other party on the ballot, however many votes were cast, um, you have to have supporters that is 1% of that number. Usually now it's about 47,000 people. Um, these supporters must be registered voters and cannot have participated in the primary or convention for another party. Now you can have participated um, for, you know, in some way with a new party, but you can't have participated um, with another party. And they have to, um, all the supporters must sign um, a petition in order to get a candidate on the ballot and each page of signatures must be notarized. And that's really cumbersome, it's really difficult. It's difficult to find 47,000 people who will be able to sign a petition, but it's also really difficult to get all of those signatures notarized because a notary has to verify that the person um, actually is who they say they are, You know, check their driver's license or something like that when they sign. Um, and it's also, you know, difficult if, if somebody's collecting signatures to find people who are number one registered and number two did not participate in the primary already. So this is a, it's difficult to get a new party on the ballot. So to get on the primary ballot, you have to file an application with the state or county party chair. So if you want to run as a Democrat, you apply um, to the state or county Democrat um, party chair and you have to pay a fee or submit a petition with a certain number of signatures. So for example if I wanted to run um, for um, U.S. Senate from the state of Texas I would have to pay either five thousand dollars or have a petition that had five thousand signatures on it that um, you know, people saying that they wanted me to be able to um, be on the ballot, the primary ballot. Once you have earned a place on the ballot, um, the county or state chair and the executive committee of the party hold drawings to determine the order of names on the ballot. And so they would put all of the um, people running for U.S. Senate um, together, you know, in a hat and pull the names. And so that's, you know, how they get the order of candidates. And so it's more fair than if, you know, you just listed maybe the incumbent first or if you listed people in alphabetical order. After the names are on the ballot, the chair and the executive committee certifies the ballot. Um, they choose election judges for each precinct, so people who can be in charge of the precinct to make sure that the election process runs smoothly. They choose what kind of voting devices they're going to use, machines or paper or you know, some other manner of voting. They select a polling place and they print the ballots or make sure that somebody is, is in charge of printing the ballots. The primary is always held on the first Tuesday of March in even numbered years. So first Tuesday in March this year, um, in 2020, there was a primary election. And after the election, the chair of the executive committee goes to the polling places and certifies the result. So they, they collect um, the information from all of the different polling places and they certify those results. And that's why sometimes there's a little bit of a lag after the um, polls close before we actually know, they'll say, you know, so many precincts reporting um, so we actually know who um, the winner is. To win in a primary, a candidate must get 50% plus one of the votes or else there's gonna be a runoff. So if there are um, three different people running for the same U.S. Um, Senate spot that I'm running for um, and I get 40% of the vote, 
and each of them get 30% of the vote, there has to be a runoff because I didn't get 50% plus one of the votes. Um, and so there would be a runoff the fourth Tuesday of May. Very, very few people vote in the primaries, um, and usually the people that vote are old, well-educated, affluent, and ideologically extreme. Um, turnout in primaries is very, very low. Um, an open primary means that anyone can vote in any primary, so you don't have to be a registered Republican or a registered Democrat. You don't have to um, only vote in a certain primary. You could vote in whatever primary you wanted to vote. Texas is like that. 14 other states do the same thing. There are some states that do a closed primary where you have to say your preference when you're registering to vote. And if you're going to change that preference, you have to do it more than 30 days before the primary election. So you would have to register as a Republican or a Democrat and if you wanted to change that before the primary, you'd have to do that more than a month before the primary. Independents either don't get to vote in primaries in nine states, or you get to choose what primary you want to vote in in nine other states. If you vote in a party's primary, you can only vote in that party's runoff election for the primary. If you didn't vote in the primary, you can vote in either party's runoff. So. Let's give an example. In Texas, say I vote in the Republican primary, and then there's a runoff um, in the Democratic primary. I can't vote for in the runoff election um, for the Democratic Party because I didn't vote in the uh, because I voted for the Republican primary. I voted in the Republican primary um, initially. Now, if I missed voting in the primary altogether, and there turns out to be um, a runoff in the Democratic primary and a runoff in the Republican primary, I could vote in either of those. I can't vote in both, but I can vote in either. You cannot vote in multiple primaries. So once you voted in a primary, you can't go across the way and vote in the other primary. With the Texas system, there is the chance of crossover voting, meaning strategically voting in the other party's primary. This is really dicey, though, because um, you may think, OK, I'm um, a Republican and I want um, to choose the very worst um, Democratic presidential candidate, so they'll be assured to lose. Um, and so I'm going to vote in the Democratic primary for just the absolute worst candidate. Um, that's fine. You can absolutely do that legally in Texas. However, what happens if that absolutely worst um, candidate in the Democratic primary ends up somehow squeaking out the election and we have the absolute worst president in the history of ever? That would be pretty bad. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, strategy here, but it's, it's not done very much just because um, people don't really like to gamble so much with their votes, especially people who are um, interested enough and ideologically extreme enough to vote in a primary election. So we've talked about this step one and you've gotten on the ballot. Now let's talk about the general election. The general election is step two in the process. Now, general elections, like the one um, for the president right now, um, is administered by public officials, not party officials. So it's not a private party putting on the election and determining the, the um, way that um, names are listed on the ballot and renting the voting machines, things like that. It is all public officials who are doing it. The winner is chosen by a plurality not 50% plus one. So again, if in the presidential election, there is one candidate who gets, um, you know, 40% and two other candidates that get 30%, then the one who gets 40% wins. The general election is held on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November in even numbered years. So if you grab your calendar, you'll see that this year that's November 3rd the first month, I mean, the first Tuesday after the first Monday. 
even numbered years. The governor is elected in the president's midterm year, so um, not in the same year that the president is elected. Um, midterm means um, in the middle of the presidential term, so that would be 2018 or 2022, um, and that is when the Texas governor is elected. They do this in Texas to try to put a little bit of distance between um, the national and the state campaigns. Um, and you'll see in our next um, discussion, there was a long time in Texas where um, people who call themselves Texas Democrats would vote for one party in the um, state elections and one party in the um, national elections. And so, um, that might not be the entire reason, but it's one of the reasons why we um, keep our elections, you know, our governor elections um, separate from the presidential election. Turnout is much, much, much lower in um, midterm elections than in presidential elections. So if I go vote, um, this year and I decide that um, I want to write somebody in to vote uh, to vote for for president can I just write in whoever I want like Bugs Bunny or um, Cardi B or somebody can I just write whoever in yes I can because nobody can stop me but that person won't win unless they file a declaration of candidacy with the Secretary of State 70 days before the election and pay any kind of filing fee or petition, um, get a petition with signatures on it. Now, if there is a write-in candidate that does all of these things, their name is gonna be posted at the election site, but then voters would actually have to write their name on the ballot. Sometimes there are special elections, and that's not something that necessarily comes in um, an even numbered year. And that happens when there's a vacancy in um, the US um, Senate or House, the Texas Senate, the Texas House, or some kind of city council um, vacancy. And what happens is someone is elected to basically finish out the term of the person who caused the vacancy. So the person who retired or was you know, thrown out of office or died or something like that. Um, and so then the next general election, um, the person will be up for, um, for election for that to fill that spot for a normal term. Now to get on the ballot in a special election, you just fill out an application and pay the filing fee you don't need to go through a primary process. And to win, you have to get a majority of the votes or else you have to go to a runoff, 50% um, plus one. Now, let's talk about ballots a little bit. There is strategy and thought that goes into ballot construction. You can be assured that some political scientists and some psychologists did a lot of studying on um, ballots. There are two different kinds. The party column ballot, which in, um, encourages straight ticket voting, and the office block ballot, which encourages you to vote for different parties for different offices, so split ticket voting. Again, like I said, um, the ballot is going to be printed in English and Spanish, and then in another language if 5% or 10,000 people in that county don't understand English enough to participate in the voting process. And if so, then that's um, the ballot's going to be printed in their native language too. Now, this is an example of the office block ballot. Um, you can see that, for example, um, where it says United States Senator, it lists the Republican, the Democrat, and the Libertarian. And so I could choose a Republican for one thing. I could choose a Democrat for the next thing. Um, it's all of the candidates for a certain office listed in a block. Now this is a party column ballot. Um, and what that is, is you can see, it's actually should, 
is, looks like a party row ballot to me, but um, everybody from a certain party is listed in a line. So if I know I want to pick all the Democrats, then I would know. I would vote, um, you know, Barack Obama and Joe Biden, and then I would vote for Kristen, um, Kirsten Gillibrand, and then I would vote for Dan Lamb, and just down the line like that. Um, so in order to have your right to vote protected, it's not just your right to show up at the polls, but it's your right to have a secret ballot and a fair election and the ballots counted correctly. All of that, if one of those things is compromised, then your right to vote has been denied. And that's, you know, when, when you talk about um, integrity of an election, that's exactly what um, we're discussing is there has to be a secret ballot. The ballots have to be counted correctly and there has to be fairness in the election. Um, the Australian ballot is um, a ballot, the ballot that we use, and um, it lists all of the candidates on one ballot. It's printed at the expense of the public and is only available at the voting place. So you can't just print it out um, online and then take it to the polling place or drop it in the mail or something like that. Um, it's only available at the polling place, and um, it is printed with, you know, taxpayer dollars. Now, if there's a close election, there can be a recount. Recounts are $60 per precinct if it's a paper um, method, like where you bubble in like a Scantron, um, or it's $100 per precinct and if the voting was done electronically. Um, the person who's challenging must lose by less than 10% in order to get a recount. And if you win or tie the recount, you don't have to pay. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, if you were running for a Dallas County office, there are 800 precincts. So you would end up paying um, $48,000 if it's a paper precinct or $80,000 if they're all electronic. Um, if you win or tie, you don't have to pay that, but you have to be ready to pay that if you lose your recount. Um, early voting is something that we have um, in the United States, but also in Texas. You can vote anywhere in the precinct and it lasts for 14 days and ends four days before the election. Um, I have talked to some people who have early voted this year and it's, it's like they just shop for um, a place to vote. You know, they'll see a long line this place and then their friend will text and say, hey, I'm at this other polling place. The line is pretty short. And so they'll just race on over to the other polling place. So you can vote anywhere in the precinct and you don't have to worry about being in the right location. So if you decide that you want to win an election, you um, need, will have better success if you follow these um, rules. You should be running in the most popular party in the area. You should be the incumbent. You should be able to mobilize large groups of voters. You should use strategy to choose what issues you are going to pursue and decide where to campaign and how much you're gonna engage in negative campaigning, if at all, and get the timing right. And in Texas, you're gonna have a better chance if you're an Anglo male. Um, Raul Gonzalez was the first Latino elected um, to a statewide office in 1986, and Morris Overstreet was the first African-American elected to a statewide office um, in 1990. Okay, two more slides. Um, how are you going to pay for an election? You can have um, independent expenditures, so your own money, um, or you can get your friends, um, other businesses, your businesses, um, political action committees. You can get loans, corporations to sponsor you, um, professional associations to um, give you money. Sometimes you'll see like a sign that says like firefighters for Raul Gonzalez or something like that. And um, that is a, an example of a professional association giving um, a candidate money. 
Um, the money spent on things like digital ads, direct mail ads, um, newspaper ads, or online ads, um, billboards, radio or TV, yard signs, phone banks, um, consulting firms, pollsters, all kinds of different places that you would spend your money. You can also get what's called soft money, and that is just like not actual cash, but other things like maybe somebody gives you an office um, to work in, or maybe somebody says that they will um, host a dinner for you or something like that. Then that's just soft money because it's things that you didn't have to pay for, but it's some benefit you're getting as a candidate. Um, in Texas, there are no public funds and there are also no limits. So we are the wild, wild west and people can spend as much money as they want um, in their elections. Texas spending laws, you um, can do basically whatever you want, except you can't spend or raise money until there's a campaign treasurer appointed. So you'll notice on all these signs, they'll be say something like, um, you know, so-and-so campaign treasurer. Um, those, somebody has to, have, to um, be appointed a treasurer before they can um, start raising or spending money. You can't receive cash for more than $100, and you can't receive direct contributions from a corporation or a labor union. Um, you have to get the money indirectly from a political action committee. Candidates and treasurers have to file sworn statements of account, um, so under the penalty of perjury, and if they are incorrect or if they're lying, they can be fined and face criminal penalties. So. That is the end of um, voting in elections, end of the first unit, I mean the first lesson in the first unit, sorry about that. Um, and so there are four lessons in this unit, so you can go now on to lesson number two.